Barbara Hewson, welcome back to Jewish Latin Princess. How are you? Oh, it's so good to be here. It's always good to see you. I love talking to you. Me too. The pleasure is mine. Do you know that you were here? I think you were episode number four, Barbara, of this show back in 2017. Wow. Yes. And now look at us now. This is episode 141, I think, something like that. So that's pretty awesome. And I'm delighted to have you back. So much has happened since. For one, we have a new name, which is very exciting. (laughs) You were here as Barbara Stani. Yes. Yeah. And so many programs, your coaching programs, your retreats, your online programs. I mean, pre-COVID, you had retreats. And there's a new book, a new book that is coming out January 2021. Very exciting. I'm loving the title already. It's Rewire for Wealth, Three Steps Any Woman Can Take to Program Her Brain for Financial Success. That's pretty awesome. Let's talk about it, shall we? Let's do let me just let me ask you this let me start sorry to cut you off but I want to start with the title because you talk about women in your title so my first question is is there a difference between the way men and women think about finances or think about money and if so what's the difference there's many ways they, they, they think but the biggest thing I think this is one of the things that attracted me to the whole subject of neuroscience was when I read that men and women see, they they see investing very differently. Their their brain processes information differently. Mm -hmm. For men, they see the market and investing as a challenge, an exciting challenge. Women see the market and investing as a threat. Mm. And so our brains were programmed for survival <laughs> and our, our ancestral brains are always on the lookout for threat. So when women start to invest, very often what happens unbeknownst to them is they see it as a threat unconsciously and they will flip their, their conscious mind goes offline and they will flip into fight, fight or freeze, freeze. Uh huh, which is what's holding a lot of women back from investing and really making their money work for them. It's the the number one reason. Studies have shown this. I wrote my very first book, Prince Charming Isn't Coming, in 1995. Mm-hmm. Since then, 25 years or how many years it's been, surveys always tell us the same thing. Women know they need to do something but they aren't doing enough to protect themselves financially. And the number one reason is they lack the confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think my personal opinion, having been in this business for 25 years, I think they lack the confidence because of the way financial education, not yours, yell, not, not yours, Mm -hmm. but the way the traditional financial education is, is geared. It's all about uh, the facts and, and the practical stuff, which is important. Right. But what happens, it doesn't deal with with our emotions. It doesn't deal with our fears. It doesn't deal with our fight, fight and freeze. Mm -hmm. And, and we don't, we have, we don't have the confidence. Now, the interesting thing is because we lack the confidence, it actually makes us better investors. Survey after survey shows that women actually perform better. Men's women's portfolio portfolios perform better because of the very reason men because they're so (laughs) self-assured, they tend to trade, go in and out. Women, because we lack confidence, we tend to buy and hold, which is a much better strategy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That, That is a much better strategy. So, and even, Barbara, let me ask you this, because a lot of women don't even get to that step. I find a lot of women who I talk to who haven't even gotten to the step of having a cushion of savings that, you know, for let's say a pandemic or something is, you know, they want to start a new venture and they need a little bit of financial runway or there's an emergency. We don't, we don't, we don't like to talk about the negative, but the, you know, like even the savings, I think a lot of times women are lagging behind. So all of that is connected right to the way we are. We think everything's connected to the way we think because our behavior, everything we do, walking, talking, spending, saving, it is all controlled by our brain. Mm -hmm. And our brain is shaped by our thoughts. 
So what we think, the thoughts we have, the feelings we have, are immediately transferred to our brain and they release chemical, uh, chemical electrical impulses that start sculpting our brain. Mm -hmm. And the more you think a thought, the deeper that neural pathway grows until it becomes hardwired and it becomes a habit. So yeah, everything is, it goes back to our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And it's so, that's why it's so important to really watch what you think. Watch what we think. And let me ask you this. Do you think, because you address the fact about financial education, so it makes me think that you probably are thinking that we have been conditioned perhaps to think about money in a certain way that it's not like we have this inborn necessarily trait that is differing from men, but that like in a, on a certain, on a certain level we've been conditioned. And that means that we, that's good news actually, because that means we could really, really work on changing that. Of course. Yes. So I'm going to take it even farther back. So when I wrote my first book, let me just put it this way. I realized early on that women's difficulties with money has very little to do with money and has everything to do with our fear of or ambivalence about power. And my definition of a powerful woman is someone who knows who she is, who knows what she wants, and expresses that in the world unapologetically. And Basically, our fear of power is our fear of becoming who we truly are. Mm. It's our fear of shining our light, our fear of speaking up, saying what, what, asking for what we want, saying no to what we don't, because we're so afraid of rocking the boat that we kind of dim ourselves down. We, we, we dim ourselves down so we don't make waves. And what I've noticed is it's not about having more money in the bank. I mean, I'm all about wealth building. It's not about having more money in the bank as much as who you have to become mm. to be a container that can attract and sustain and build wealth. I love that. Yeah, you have to be the, the vessel to receive that abundance, to be that manager of that gift, right? To be, to, to attract it and to contain to hold it and to grow it for exactly. so many of us it's like water going through our fingers and you're getting back to your idea of savings money comes in because wealth does not come from what you earn or what you marry or what you inherit what wealth you comes from what you do with that money exactly. wealth comes from what you save from what you keep exactly. and for many it's like just water going through the fingers exactly and those behaviors are like you said they're coming back from whatever's here that we need to reprogram so that we actually build that yes. container without any leaks and i love what you said because wealth really i always tell women like wealth allows you to shine your light like money is like an amplifier you know like you're a generous person you'll be able to be more generous you're a creative soul you'll be more creative it amplifies who you already are it allows you to shine a lot brighter and but it also amplifies some dark places mm -hmm. money amplifies shame there's so much shame around money and I believe that money does not cause shame. Money amplifies the shame we already have. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that working with our shame will is a very important component of financial education for women. Yeah, yeah, the we inner have been, work. Been conditioned. Yeah, we have been conditioned to be, to hold the back. Yes. We have been, we have not been conditioned to be wealthy and powerful. I remember when I wrote my first book, I interviewed a psychologist her name was Olivia Mellon mm -hmm. and I asked her why are women so afraid of their power and she said something that gave me full body chills she said because powerful women have been burned at the stake Ugh, yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> women usually have that reaction to it that same reaction is what I had oh yeah so it's kind of part of our collective unconscious yeah 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 what's interesting is Barbara we're, we're, yeah tell me Go on. That now I'm, I'm looking at this new um, line of work that you're doing with rewiring for wealth. 
when we first had a conversation here on the show, you had, you were really talking about the spiritual element, which again, it all goes tied together to what we're saying now. There's a lot of the inner work that people have to do. It's not just about the numbers. It's never just about the numbers. And now you've taken it a step further and said, okay, okay, there's the spiritual part, but ladies, there's also everything that's happening up here. We got to work on our neurons. There's science behind all this. But it goes together. Right. Because it's, it's, it's the practical, it's the spiritual. It, 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 what I believe is getting smart or smarter about money is a combination of the outer work, the inner work, the higher work, and the deeper work of wealth. And the outer work is telling you there's to be stock in a bond and, you know, getting your retirement plan set, negotiating for a raise, all that, that's important. And, and, and for some people, that's no problem. But for those who get stuck, it's really important to do the inner work, which is the psychological, emotional, to look at the beliefs and the decisions and the limiting thoughts that that are holding us back. But what's also important, because women, we are not motivated. Once we have, once we're financially stable, once we have a roof over our head, food on the table, you know, some extra money to get a mani pedi, we are not motivated by money. What motivates us is the opportunity to do what we're here to do and to help others. And that's what I call the higher work of wealth. That's the spiritual component is really doing God's work. Yeah. And and we it's hard to do that when we're drowning in debt and struggling to make ends meet. Exactly. Exactly. And then there's there's the deeper work, which is really the neuronal working with your neural circuits. Right. So I think it's a combination yep. of all three. So so my new book is definitely, definitely includes the spiritual. Absolutely. Now let's talk about it then. Let's talk about the rewiring process. Kata. I know you talk about certain steps that you're very particular on, on, on getting this down. What are those steps to rewiring? So it took me about five, six years to really get this. So can I tell you how the book first came about? Can Please. I just give you some facts? I would love to hear okay. that. Okay, so... So I've written, I'd written six, six, seven books. I've written seven books. What one's out of print? So I've written seven books and I've been doing this for 25 years, empowering women around money. And one day about six years, seven years ago, I got up and I didn't want to go to work. Huh. And over time I lost interest in my work. I, I was just dreading the day ahead. And I remember turning to my husband and saying, I would like to take a sledgehammer to my business and just smash it to some smithereens. It was like, I was done. Hmm. And I couldn't figure it out because this was my mission. This was my ministry. This is my, this is my purpose. Hmm. This is why I'm here. And so I, I couldn't figure out what was going. It felt like something was missing. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I'm going to take some time off. I, I stopped taking new clients. I stopped speaking. I stopped doing all the things. I kind of cleared my plate. And I just thought, what is missing? Am, or am I really done? And then during this period, I was going through my email and an article about neuroscience was in my inbox. I knew nothing about neuroscience. I printed it out and I started reading it. And it was like the light bulb went off in my brain. It was like, oh my God, this is the missing piece. This is it. And so I started studying neuroscience. I started reading about it. I started applying it, integrating it into my work, which was already includes psychology, spirituality with personal finance. And then I started experimenting it with me. And then I started experimenting with, I had all these guinea pig clients and <laughs> I started giving workshops. So after about five years, six years, I came up, I boiled it all down to three steps and also what I call three power tools, which I haven't really talked about, but the three steps. So to rewire your brain, so the mind and the brain work together, what flows through the mind shapes the brain. So you have to start because trying to change your behavior is really a, almost a lost cause. It's really hard. You change your thoughts, you definitely change the wiring in your brain, which controls your behavior. Mm -hmm. And then it, it gets easier. So 
So how do you change your thoughts so you can start wiring your brain differently? And here are the three steps. The first step, and I've given to you really quickly, and then we can talk about it more if you'd like. The first step is simply recognize a negative thought. Simply recognize a, a negative, critical thought that may be holding you back, mm -hmm. like there's never enough, right. or I'm not enough, or mine that I just finished working on is I don't have what it takes. And then you just notice that thought and you go and you notice it, not with judgment, with curiosity. Actually, I'm telling I'm saying more than I expected. So I'm just going to go ahead go, and go. explain it. You, you, you notice it with, with curiosity and you specifically say, oh, oh, isn't that interesting? I'm having a thought about not having enough. I'm having a thought about not being enough. I'm having a thought about I don't have what it takes. That separates you from your thought. And it, because you, the, your thoughts are not the truth. Every thought you have has somehow been conditioned or programmed in you. And so you realize, oh, I'm having a thought. That's not the truth. It's, though it's been wired in my brain. So that's where you start just noticing. And even if you do nothing else for a week or two, just observing those negative thoughts can be powerful. I like to think about them as little visitors that just, it's just a visitor. It's not you. It's not me. It's just a guest that came knocking on the door. <laughs> I don't have to I answer. Love I love it. I love it. <laughs> I had a client, I had a client who said, I look at them as warriors. These little boys, all they need is a hug. These little thoughts are my little boys who need a hug. So yeah, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. I love that. Uh, but those thoughts can be very insistent. Yeah. And those thoughts sometimes don't even show up as thoughts. They show up as visceral feelings. Mm -hmm. Which is, by the way, Barbara, you know, our mutual friend, our colleague, um, Barry Chester, she always talks about the body check-in. You know, like n even even for people, sometimes it's hard to get to the thought. I, I, and, and, and she talks about the fact that just notice in your in your body what's happening. You're feeling tense. Your stomach is tight. Like, just notice it and say, oh, what is it that I'm feeling? Oh, what's the thought behind this feeling, right? Oh, he's visiting exactly. me again. It, it's visiting me again. Exactly. Because for me, like, I don't have what it takes. It doesn't even show up often as a word. It shows up as this deep, dark, dread feeling. Mm -hmm. So, yes, notice that. Just notice. And that's all you do. The second step is you reframe it. You look for ways to see the situation differently. And for example, um, I, I don't, I, I, I don't have what it takes. So I, so I, I thought about it. Sometimes it's, it's not easy to reframe. I, there, there's a prayer. There's a lesson in A Course of Miracles that I use as a prayer. And I'll just say, above all else, let me see this differently. Mm -hmm. And for me, that came up as, oh, I can handle this. So I, I wrote it on, and I keep it right next to my computer. I can handle this. I'm not enough. I'm enough. It can be the opposite or it can be just a reframe. Oh, this is an opportunity to, to rewire. Just saying, oh, I'm having a negative thought. Let me rewire that. So the second is, first is you, you observe, you recognize. Second, you reframe. And the third is you respond differently. Mm. You respond differently. You respond different than you normally would. So if you're normally would, uh, like if you normally would, if you normally get scared and you go, then you, you death, then you do what you need to do. You respond differently and you must do this over and over and over and over and over again, because at the very beginning, trying to rewire a hardwired brain, it's just like everything in you will say, stop. Don't do this. It just sucks you in. Mm -hmm. and so it, but it doesn't need to take that long. Really? Tell me more. <laughs> well, in various, various things I've read, neuroscientists have said it can take a matter of days. It can take a matter of months. Really, it depends on two things, three things. It depends on your motivation, how mm -hmm. much you 
to want to change. It depends on your level of commitment, how ready you are to walk through fire to make it happen. And it, it depends on discipline because most of us are really lazy about our thinking. I yeah. get really lazy about my thinking. It's just so easy. It's just so easy because those hardwired neural pathways have the have this like gravitational pull that just sucks you in. And so it takes tremendous diligence and vigilance. So depending on how vigilant you are, it doesn't need to take a long time. And it also, I think we go through stages where we might uncover certain thought processes and what's holding us back and we might work on that. But that old ceiling now becomes my bottom. Now I find a new ceiling. There's something else that's coming to trip me over. And it's again, going back to the process of shining a light on it, right? Oh, isn't that interesting? I'm about to embark on this new endeavor and look how I'm thinking, right? <laughs> and then doing the process again, let me reframe it. And now I got to go do the thing, feel the fear. And what was that famous book, that wonderful book, feel the fear and do it anyways. <laughs> right. Right, 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 right. So I'm assuming that, well, let me ask you this. Is there of these three steps, is there a part when you've taught, when you've, you've coached so many people now at this point with this process, is there one of the three that you find is often most challenging for people, for women? Yes. Re for anybody responding differently. Be because here's, here's why. There, there's really three reasons. Actually, there, there's four of them. It's really hard to respond differently because, as I said, the neural pathway that says there's not enough or the neural pathway that says I'm not important mm -hmm. or the neural pathway that says money is bad. That has been dug so deep in you and that has a force. So it's like this gravitational force that will suck you in. So it's really hard. The second reason is because every thought you think triggers a neurotransmitter, mm -hmm. releases a neurotransmitter or a chemical. And I think there are seven or eight different chemicals, but our body literally gets addicted to those chemicals. So every time we go to think a different thought, to respond differently, we, we, it's like going through detox. Withdrawal. We go through withdrawal. Yeah. Yes. And the third reason is whenever we're stressed or tired or scared, we just automatically go back to the back old Back to the way. comfort zone, right, what we're used to. Yes. And the fourth, and this is really rarely talked about in, in literature on finance for women, but it's so important, is if there has been any trauma, any trauma, that trauma will get, if it's triggered, your brain shuts down, your rational brain, and you will go to fight, flight, and freeze. So it's really important to understand the effect trauma has had on you and to do some healing work on that trauma if you find yourself really stuck. Amazing. Really amazing. Now, Barbara, I know you said that it doesn't have to be a long process, but I think we've established that if, albeit it doesn't have to be long, it could be continuous because, like you said, we might un uncover layers of trauma or, the, you know, we, it's just like... A, it's an ongoing process for you. Is this something that you continuously try to practice? It's like become part of your habit to go through these three steps. All the time, all the time, all the time, because it gets easier. It gets really easier. However, those old neural pathways, they still linger mm -hmm. and they can be triggered. And so the quicker you you do the recognize, reframe, respond differently. It, it's much easier after a while. It's yeah. so much easier. Yeah, it, it definitely, you know what's sitting on my desk? You'll love this. Look, look at the book, it's sitting on my desk. <laughs> do you see this? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's one of the early ones I read. Yeah, I like it. Fabulous. I like it. it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's fabulous. I was just working, working through the, that the, one. The best book, the best book I have read that, that had the most impact on me was by Jeffrey Schwartz. He is an amazing, amazing neurosci neuropsychiatrist. Uh -huh. And he wrote, he's written many books, but The Mind and the Brain. It's phenomenal. And he, he, he did a landmark study years ago that he proved he could cure OCD patients. Mm -hmm. OCD is 
obsessive compulsive behaviors that they can't stop like washing their hands or not stepping on a crack. He proved he could cure OCD patients without drugs simply by training their minds to rewire their brain. So, so much of my work was influenced by his. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. Now, Barbara, you went through a personal journey that you talked to us about last time you were here. We literally, um, the it was like a major wake up call for lack of a better term. You had your, you know, just literally a major wake up call. And to a certain extent, not everybody has the, and I want to use air quotes here, the benefit or the advantage of having that big wake up call that trans that leads us to a transformation like it did to you. It, it took you into a financial, it, financial growth journey and it, it launched you. I mean, it led you to your career, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you built your own wealth on your own. You, 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 you came back, you came out of this a, a completely different woman. And what I'm trying to say is not everybody has the benefit of that. Uh, many oh, people. But, 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 yeah. But let me tell you, research shows that women do not get serious of making or managing money until they hit a crisis, ah. till they lose a job, till they lose a husband, or till they're on the brink of the retirement. So I have seen, what, now, maybe they weren't as uh, as fun to talk about as mine, but crisis, crisis happens a lot for women. It's what pushes us over the edge, and mm -hmm. this is why I really, really, and, and you do too, we really want to help women start taking charge of their money, start exactly. taking charge of their life before a crisis. Exactly. That was exactly what I was going to say. I feel like a lot of women just live on a comatose stage. Like, you know, there's no crisis, but I don't really feel very fulfilled. I don't feel like my financial life is great. I don't feel like I'm living in alignment with my values. It's like low level anxiety, stress. And I feel like that's the norm. And what's so wonderful about your work is you're saying, no, 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 no. You got to change that. And here are the tools for you to change that because you can change your circumstances from being just blah to being actually great from just barely making it or having enough or, you know, to actually building wealth. And you have the power to do that. And you don't have to hit a crisis, but you also don't have to live in this like uh, comfort zone. That's like blah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I know it, and you, I don't know if you heard the, read the latest study it just came out a couple days ago. They found 54% of millennials, uh -huh. millennial women, depend on their husband, millennials who are married, depend on their husband for financial advice, for financial guidance, and to take care of the finances. Really? I'm really surprised, actually. I know. Seriously. I thought millennials just, were like, hello. <laughs> no, no, no. I always say the Prince Charming myth is alive and well. Oh, it may not gosh. be a man. But so many women, young and old, in fact, boomers are, are much farther along, but so many, so many women are waiting for something or someone or just an amorphous something to rescue them. It's part of our collective unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting. You said not everyone has the gift of a crisis, but it's true. The crisis can be a gift. Yeah. It just, it's, it's a really horrible gift to have to work through. It's not fun. You know, it's not fun. It makes it harder. You don't think clear when you're in a crisis exactly so this is why this work is so important because ladies you could actually don't have to wait for a crisis you should actually start with this process and notice because we all have them come on we all have these negative thoughts that on some level are holding us back from building the light that we want so if we go through this process that you've laid out for us now barbara you kind of mentioned in passing three power tools is that different from oh. the three steps that you mentioned so it's funny. I haven't talked about this to anybody. I don't know even why I mentioned it. I haven't mentioned this before. But <laughs> maybe I want to start talking about them because they're really cool. Um, so what I what I realized is you take people through the process. Mm -hmm. Recognize, reframe, respond differently. People get stuck. I got stuck. Uh -huh. You want to give up. And so what I came up with, what I call them power tools, but would just how to help you when you get stuck. And the first, I'll tell you what they are. The first is resistance work. The second is reparenting work. And the third is repetition. And every time, so let me talk about resistance because resistance is 
absolutely normal. It is inevitable. Every time you go to the next level, anytime you go to do something new, your your body's going to say, no, don't go there because success in anything, whether it's making more money or losing more weight is always found just outside your comfort zone and, and you will resist. And the key, you don't, resistance is normal. And whenever I go into resistance all the time, I always go, oh, goody, that means I'm going to the next level. Mm -hmm. So resistance doesn't need to stop you for very long um, if you know how to work with it. And really, just to go through this quickly, all re resistance comes from fear. Yeah. And under fear is a belief. And every belief at the core of every belief is a decision you made about yourself or about money. And it's getting back to that decision that you made and reframing it and making a new decision and really exploring what your fears are. So that's just a quick way. Reparenting is because there is a little child in us. There is many parts of us, but there is definitely a little girl. And that little girl is often running our show. That, that little girl who grew up in a family that says money is bad is running our show. You can't make money. That's bad. That little girl who grew up where their parents were big spenders, she'll find herself spending. The, the woman will find herself spending and she doesn't understand it. So it's really important to do reparenting work. And this is especially true if there's been any early trauma or early shame. And, and the way, it, this is a, a story that's often used to describe how our our little girl, our child takes over. So imagine you're in a car and you're, you're driving along and everything's fine. And your little girl, you as a three-year-old is strapped in back in the car seat and she's just playing. And then all of a sudden a car passes by and starts screaming. The driver starts screaming. And this little girl that feels very vaguely familiar. She tears off her seatbelt. She jumps in the front seat. She pushes you aside. She takes the car. She can't drive, your feet can't reach the pedals, but she looks at you and says, I got this. <laughs> and you, stunned, don't know what to do. And that's what happens when our little girl takes over and starts driving us. And so it's very important to do some reparenting work, really going back and talking to that little girl, finding out what is going on and reparenting her, giving her different messages, telling her you'll take care of her. She can stay in the back seat. She doesn't need, in, in the book, there's a whole meditation to do. And the third is repetition. And, and repetition means doing, responding differently over and over and over again. But there's some very interesting things about repetition. For example, you don't even have to do something physically. If you visualize it, if you imagine it, it that those same areas of your brain respond they did, they did a study where they had a group of people learn to play a simple song on the piano. They had a, another group also learn to play the single, only they didn't use their fingers. They just imagined their fingers. Have you heard of this study? I've heard of it. It's and, fascinating. And, and, and they found that the areas of the brain that controlled the fingers were both changed, whether they really played the piano or they imagined it. So there's all kinds of ways to to repeat, to respond differently that don't always entail you, you actually doing something. Yeah, I find that really, really fascinating. I just had a guest come on the show and talk about vision boards, for example, and the power of actually creating vision boards for your objectives and first putting what you want in writing and flushing it all out to like the tiniest detail and then actually creating that board that you look at every day, kind of that poster that you talked about before that you, you look at and you remind yourself because again, you're conditioning your mind to think that that's what's happening in the present. You're feeling the emotions of, of being in that reality and then the brain thinks, oh, she's there. Like, that, that, that is reality. <laughs> it's amazing. It's really, really powerful stuff. Now, Barbara, let me ask you this. It's your eighth book. You, obviously, you've built a career. You built wealth after the years that you were struggling. You built a career. Um, 
you build a business out of your writing, which actually, that's what I want to ask you first. I want to ask you about this because a lot of my listeners sometimes feel like, oh, well, she had the resources to do it. And, you know, who am I to do it? What you were talking about before. And here you are as an example of somebody who built a business out of something that, you know, writers are not necessarily the best, you know, paying people. Okay, pay. I, I just have to tell you, I, I do not make my my books are not my business. Exactly. You my, build the I, business. I don't make money off my books. Right. So tell us about that process, but because I think it's important for people to know that you can build wealth doing what you love and getting creative around it, which is exactly what you did. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I spirit led me to write. Mm -hmm. Spirit leads me to write. I, this is God's work. It's like, I always say, quoting Mother Teresa, I am a pencil in God's hand. Mm -hmm. So I write my books. And I, I don't write them for money. I, I write my books because it's always what I, I need to learn. Everything, every book I have ever written is what I need to learn. And I, by my research and my interviews, I learn it. But my passion, like yours, is empowering women financially. That That's my passion. And I want, but my passion is not to teach it as a practical process, but is also a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And I put those two together. And yeah, I built the, the, the books have been great in spreading, in creating visibility for me. And from that, I've been able to build a business and it's given me cachet and, uh, and financial freedom. I, yeah. I, I remember. So I, I'm a, I was a chronic under earner, chronic under earner for Which is so whole. hard to imagine you as such. <laughs> And I remember I started interviewing women for my second book, uh, Secrets of Six Figure Women. And I decided I was going to make $125,000 mm -hmm. that year, which was, I don't think I'd ever made more than 25000 I was 40, I was in my late 40s. Wow. And I put, I put a post-it note up and I wrote $125,000 on it. And my second ex-husband comes in. And he says, what's that? And I tell him. And he starts laughing. Ugh. He said, how are you going to make that? You don't even, you don't have a background in finance. How are you going to make that money helping women? And I took that post-it note off. In fact, I have it somewhere here. I, I keep it on my desk. I took that. I, here it is. All right. Here's that. I, I framed it. I wrote $125,000. Wow. I took it off and then I wrote, yes, you can. I've had that on my desk ever since. And, and yes, I did. Yes, I did. I made 120. And that was the beginning of making six figures for the rest of my life. So the truth so, is that you've been doing the work that you talk about rewire, you rewire for wealth. <laughs> the three, you've been doing it since then. You just had never really put it into a structure and told exactly. people about it. Exactly. I learned, I learned when I wrote my first book, Prince Charming Isn't Coming, I wanted to know how to get smart about money because I was clueless. So I started interviewing all these women who were smart with money. And the biggest thing I learned from them, biggest, was it wasn't what they did, it was how they thought. And when I shifted my thinking, that's what changed. What I didn't understand is how to take shifting my thinking to actually rewiring my brain. Mm -hmm. And that what I realized now is that would have absolutely expedited my learning curve and it absolutely expedites the learning curve when you can just not change your thoughts but really realize how to rewire your brain so you don't get that resistance that hard resistance to going forward i love it i love it i love it now i want to ask you this and you've alluded to it but i want you to like really leave it very clear for listeners at this point barbara you could just be sitting on the beach sipping pina coladas but you're not you're running your programs you just finished your 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 eighth book it's coming out you're super generous you pour into you were a guest on one of my on my program on jewish money makeover your guest on shows you pour you i know you you give so much to women it's not about the money. And I think you said it before, but you're still, you're still doing this. What is it that it's about? What motivates you that you're still going? Because it's not the money you, that, you, that you made. God, God motivates me. It's, it's, I, I'm here to do God's work. And I, I feel, and that's why there are several times, I mean, several times I felt God said, okay, you're done. And I'd say, okay, I'm done. 
but I wasn't. And then when God says, you're done, I'm done. But I sure hope it's not for a long time because I really love this work. I really, really love it. It gives me great joy. And I think because I know what it was like for 40 some years to not to understand money, to be married to a compulsive gambler who went through my inheritance, to have three children and he left the country and I had a million dollars in tax bills and I was terrified and my father wouldn't lend me money. It's like, I was so terrified. I was so, I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I prayed and, and that's when this, it was very much of a spiritual practice for me, but that that's motivated. I don't ever want any woman to go through that. Yeah. 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 I just want to highlight, you said it brings me joy because at the end of the day, when we are serving, when we are really serving our divine calling, our creator, when you feel like God has called me to do something, all of this that you've gone through is because you need to be of service to other people. That's, the Im- that's joy right there. That is the I joy. Mean- well, you, you are the, you are a picture. You are the poster child for that. <laughs> yes. I'm very proud that I like, I love what I do. I love serving women and it lights me up and I don't ever really want to stop doing it. And yes, I love making money doing it too, <laughs> because that means I could serve more people. Yeah. I, 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 I love making money. I haven't given up on, I love earning. I love what it allows me to do. Exactly. But I have to say, my fortune came. My fortune came from investing. Mm. My fortune came from investing. I make good money and I have a, a lot of fun and I do a lot of stuff with it. But my fortune came from building. From slowly, I, I, everything was gone. Every, almost everything. Not everything. I had a couple properties that that spewed out money. And if I lived frugally, and I saved, I saved, I saved, and I started investing. And so I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in investing and creating wealth. Me too. Make that money work for you. <laughs> Me too. Barbara, tell us where we can find you. The book is on pre-sale now, correct? Yes, it's, it's on all the websites. Um, all the, the, it, I know it's on Amazon and I think it's on Border, Barnes and Nobles. And yeah, so it's so exciting. It's so exciting. Very exciting. Have you written a- book yeah have you written a book let's talk about that here publicly so that everybody can hold me accountable you've written what eight books I have so many books on me inside of me and I had said a couple weeks ago I told a friend that by Hanukkah 2020 I would have the manuscript for my first book I have about six or eight weeks to go I haven't started but I know I could do it what do you think Barbara (laughs) what do you think I I don't know if you'll have your manuscript script ready by then you you may you may be a quick worker but i would love to support you thank you you need to write a book and there's no accident that i asked you this thank you thank you yes there definitely is no accident because you had no idea about this that i have this book in me and my husband told me the other day you've been teaching your program i've seen your notes there's the book yeah i'll just sit and put it all together and there's your book i'm like yeah i know so i just need to turn off my phone Uh, i'll help you I will help you. you. If there's anything I, I can do. Thank you. Thank you. Now that, that, that's motivating. I'm going to sit and write that book and I'll call you crying, Barbara, I'm stuck. And then you'll give me the kick. You've got, you got this, Yael. You got to keep working on it. <laughs> so ladies, there's a book coming out. <laughs> but in the meantime, go, go um, buy on Amazon. Go on the pre-sale and get Rewire for Wealth. Three steps any woman can take to program her brain for financial success right now. And follow Barbara. Barbara, you also have a wealth, uh, what do you call it? The Wealth Collect Connection? Yeah, you can, well, you can go to my website and I am getting a brand new website, but I still have my old embarrassing website. But I, <laughs> but go to my website, barbara Hyphen Houston. barbara Houston H-U-S-O-M. And you can see all kinds of things. But yeah, I have, this was my dream. I have created a community of women. It's a safe place for women to talk about money and anything related to finances. And it's an online community and we do education and group coaching and individual coaching. And we have a book club. We have Ask the Bookkeeper. We have all kinds of programs. 
It's so fabulous. It's called the Wealth Connection. So please check it out. Yes, yes. And it's so important because back to the original, like this ties it full circle about the way women think. I think the part of connecting with others and having that support, right, really motivates us to change because we're relationship creatures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a Emory University that did, did a study a long time ago, and they found that a part of women's brains light up when they can collaborate with other women to learn about money. Mm -hmm. And that is, it's really important far more than men. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Barbara, thank you for being here. It is always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the work that you do for being so generous with your wisdom, with your experience. And we look forward to staying in touch, to greeting this book, to actually devouring this book and putting all the principles into practice. Thank you again for being on the show. Thank you.